Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and this is Movie Stuff. This is my bi-weekly show on Brooklyn Free Speech 2. I am Jim Gisrael. I review movies and make movie-related videos and all sorts of stuff on YouTube, and I'm here to bring my content to television. Basically, how this works is every episode we have a theme, and then I show a collection of videos I have made that fit that theme, and tonight's theme is going to be early animation. In terms of film history and, I think, normal people, I guess, don't really talk that much about early animation. You talk about Steamboat Willie, you might hear about Windsor McKay, who actually started here in Brooklyn, believe it or not. And early animation has a long history in Brooklyn, so we really should be talking about it more, especially here. Regardless of that, I wanted to show two different things about two different kind of uh, things and kind of educate you a little bit, but also uh, they're kind of interesting videos on early animation. One is uh, Kiriano Cristiani, who directed the first animated feature film, actually directed the first two animated feature films and the first one with sound as well. Unfortunately, that is all lost. That is part of a show I do every month or so called Lost film file. It is uh, a cool show. I, I basically find films that are historically important or any kind of interesting film that is lost and like is completely gone and basically all of the first animated feature films, the first few, are completely gone. They're uh, from Argentina. They're kind of political films but those were the first animated feature films that I'm going to talk about his story first and then after that I'm going to actually have a really short uh, animated film that I made called Parts uh, which is kind of cool and then uh, finishing off the show is going to be a short film, a kind of short documentary, I guess, I made called Night at the Cartoon Carnival. This is about Tommy Stathis, or Tommy Lee Stathis, who uh, is a really cool guy, does a thing called the Cartoon Carnival all throughout Brooklyn and Queens, showing classic animated cartoons. I know he's most known for Between Windsor McKay and when Felix the Cat came in, but he shows all sorts of cartoons and there. It's a really good time. It's a really good show where he'll just, with the film projector, uh, cut together a whole reel of like tons of classic animated cartoons that you wouldn't see any else and uh, I highly recommend it you should check out his uh, Facebook page it's the cartoon carnival and his website which is going to be below as well he makes a uh, blu-rays of these collections of cartoons as well that you really can't get anywhere else and I they're really really great he does really great work in trying to preserve animation history because not a lot of people do if it's outside of Disney and the major companies that kind of falls by the wayside and Tommy kind of picks that stuff up and really appreciates it and I wanted to make a documentary about the cartoon carnival because it's such a unique thing and specific to this area I think we really should appreciate the people who are doing those sort of things and uh, definitely like if you like the short film at the end of the show try to check out one of those because you will not regret going to one they're so much fun and Tommy's such a great guy and he's really doing a lot of like big film history work that no one else is taking on and he's really made it a cause for himself and I'm happy to have worked with and made this short film but please check out his facebook group at the very least and go to one of those things they're not it's not too expensive it's like less than going to the movies and you'll probably be thinking about a whole world of animation that you never thought of before i hope you enjoy uh this show and you enjoy uh, hearing about early animation thank you very much for watching me on brooklyn free speech 2 or if you are streaming watching me on that as well and uh here we go <laughs> And Criano Cristiani might be maybe one of the most important people in animation to have almost everything lost. He directed the first two animated feature films. This was uh, years before Prince Ahmed. And he was also the first one to make an animated film with sound years later. He's also the first person to direct more than one animated feature film. He's done all these incredible firsts, but sadly, we don't have any of it. Most people, and even like, in terms of Hollywood and American Europe, weren't aware of these films until Walt Disney did a South American tour for research for Saludos Amigos much later, like after Snow White and so forth. Even then people couldn't see it. So in terms of influence, I wouldn't say he has much of one because just no one could see them. Often these films had one print only and then were destroyed in a fire. How this was the first thing, but it is not the most influential thing and that's a difference in art history. Now I still think he is ahead of his time, so much so it's ridiculous. He should deserve more credit for doing things with animation and, and especially political films about animation before anyone was even doing animation, which is insane. Kiriano Cristiani mainly used cutout animation, which is similar to what Lottie Reininger did, but he was originally uh, did political cartoons, which were very big in the Argentinian newspapers. He wasn't the most famous illustrator to make political cartoons in Argentina, but he certainly was one of them. What took him from just being 
being just another political cartoonist to being a ahead of his time animator was producer Federico Valli who had worked with the Lumiere brothers and had some knowledge of film and actually had some Emil Cole stuff who uh, he would then show to uh, Kiriano Cristiani and had a newsreel series and came up with the idea like hey why don't we have an animated part in his newsreel series which was called Actolidas Valley. It's like two minutes of animation but he had it in there. That is also lost but that starts basically uh, all of Kiriano Cristiani's films have something to do with then president of Argentina Hippolito Uruguayan. I'll probably just call him Uruguayan because I'm not going to say any of that right unfortunately but he seems to have almost an obsession with this president uh, going after him for various things. It seems to have started his relationship with the producer Federico Valet with that newsreel and that went over very well and they thought well let's make a film and that's where El Apostol came from. This was in 1917 that that film came out and there was one print of it and it played in a theater because a theater owner said he'd put up the money with Federico Valet who received unfortunately most of the credit but this film played was like probably the biggest success of Cariano Cristiani's whole career. Everyone loved it. It got lots of notices in the newspaper but in those notices they gave credit to Federico Valet and was given to a much more famous political satirist who made political cartoons and newspapers who is mostly known as uh, El Mano or the Monkey uh, whose actual name will be down here which is unfortunate it ran for six months in one theater when you could do that I guess in 1917 and was another satire of Yuri Guyan and particularly how he was so mad at the city of Buenos Aires he goes on top of a mountain and uh, takes Jupiter's lightning bolts and throws them at his enemies in Buenos Aires and they actually built a huge model of Buenos Aires and burnt it down because animation was a little looser then you could get away with kind of doing things like like building models and having animated characters in the models and so forth also because it seems that Curiano Cristiani sort of made up a lot of what he could and couldn't do he was mainly animated like he animated the newsreel thing on his balcony in his apartment he had a much bigger crew on this film obviously and uh Valley really believed in him but it seems like Valley wasn't necessarily political didn't have much politically to say and then kind of just was happy with the success of this film but they didn't actually work together again which is unfortunate it seems like that relationship worked more on his early works and so forth and the only thing that's left of this is some concept art and reviews and um pictures of the city that the character who Yuri Gurians uh represents I guess through lightning bolts at the city and it was a uh, lost in a fire in uh Valley's vault in 19. 19- 26 unfortunately fires is pretty much in vaults is pretty much what took out Kiriano Cristiani's entire filmography really which is sad and this was really the biggest success of his career getting tons of notices people really loved it but then his next film called Without a Trace or Sen de Jour Rastros was a little different it played about one night according to some people or it played for just a little bit but then was seized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs by Argentina because of its stance on Argentina not entering World War one this was 1918 of course it is about a sinking of an argentinian ship by a german commander baron von luxburg it was basically meant for the sinking of the ship to get argentina to go to world war one but some survivors told them what happened and so they did not go the press did not cover it at all from the little times it was shown it wasn't very well received it is critical again apparently of yuri guyan but probably the least amount of yuri guyan supposedly of all of them i think but the fact that it was seized by the foreign affairs has led people to believe this one may have survived often people say it deteriorated because it's silver nitrate no one is exactly sure the sad thing is is they didn't make copies of any of these films and i wish you know i talked earlier about how walt disney had come to argentina and met Cristiano cristiani offered him a job and like wanted him to work for him and all this stuff and loved the films of his that i guess he could have seen at that time i'm assuming he didn't actually get to see el Postal or the apostle because that had been destroyed according to this at that point so maybe he saw his film that I'm going to talk about after that but this film was not in any fire that we're sure of we're just everyone's fairly certain it deteriorated but we're not exactly sure what happened to it and since it was played the least amount and covered by the press the least amount there's almost less known about it we know what incident it's based on but we know that I'm sure Yuri Gullion had no reason to you know like this movie he might not have known because uh, Kira Cristiani was so undercovered for his first you know momentous big animated film which was also considered a big technical marvel and hailed and so forth but i think uh since no one really knew it was the same person they would have needed like you know el mano and uh frederico valley to been credited but neither of them worked on his second film i think that's probably one of the things that probably hurt him the most is the idea that he had gotten 
gotten famous through this newsreel from Federico Valle and this movie produced by Federico Valle and people didn't understand like auteurism in 1917 or anything like that as feature films were in, in itself very new at the time so but then uh, between 1918 and 1931 Carriano Cristiani kind of went away he was kind of living as a gypsy playing films for poor people with Chaplin films and other short films with uh, commercials that he would make he was doing some political cartoons and so forth but then he would go on to make Pelodopolis or uh, Polito City which would be the first animated feature film with sound with uh, the Vitaphone sound on disc system. It was a story that was about the Argentinian president, again, uh, Yuri Gunyan, floating around his his boat, which was uh, Polito City, which represented Argentina while being uh, swarmed by hungry sharks, which were supposed to be the radicals. Now, this seemed to be because Yuri Gunyan had left the presidency and then come back, and then uh, during the production had been kicked out of uh, Argentina from being the president uh, during a coup and then uh, unfortunately died I think like after this film had been released but was still playing and this film played for a little bit and he kept bringing it back and into circulation but then he took it out of circulation because it, frankly people liked Yuri Goyen and didn't really want to see him be made fun of and there were songs to it it seemed like a bigger production he animated it predominantly himself and had to change it mid-production as he wanted it or i keep reading he wanted to have it come out so he de-emphasized yuri gunyan and had more of the generals who ousted him kind of changed the emphasis of the film sounds like he had a lot of problems in production it's probably good that he was working by himself because people probably would have gotten fed up he added sound which was unprecedented at the time 31 sound was newer to film it wasn't completely new but in argentina i guess it was newer and he used the vitaphone sound on disc system because sound uh, you had to get a disc to match up with the film because there wasn't sound on actual film at that time. He got it to work and he had various songs within it, but it didn't really go over as well. And it seems like, you know, it was a very ambitious way to come back to make, like, I think it was only like around, it's kind of loose on what number animated film this would have been, but it sounds like it was honestly the fifth animated film made. And that film was later destroyed in one of the fires in either A Fire in 1957 or in Fire in 1961. He did make other films. Uh, he made a film about like the monkey clock watch maker which is on YouTube and there are various clips of his but most of his filmography has unfortunately been destroyed <laughs> these films with a crowd. Even for me, and I work with these films constantly, I will sit at home working with them, reviewing them, finding them, archiving them, and it's kind of a, it's, it's a fascinating experience, but for me it can be even kind of deadpan, but when I'm showing them to an audience and I'm seeing the audience reactions and hearing them laugh or chuckle or snicker, I start doing the same thing. So it starts coaxing those reactions out of me as well. And I think people really feed off of each other's reactions and it starts to become this really cool, you know, mutual kind of experience. <laughs> Watching them in a communal setting like that really brings out a lot more emotion and I think appreciation for them. I've been going almost regularly for a year, so 11 maybe, 12, like around there, like about a dozen at this point. Um, let's see, this is like Kirchen Carnival, like 45? Yeah. Or, um, I think I came, my first show was I think 29, it's the first time. It'll be a couple years, if not more, it seems like, I think he's up in the 40s now, yeah. so it seems like I started in the 20s, I first found out about it, so probably like four or five years, I'm guessing. <laughs> How long does it take you to put together uh, one show? Um, probably about a couple hours. So I have to find the prints I want to pull 
and then I compile them. So it could take at least a couple hours. <laughs> and also, sometimes I'm running things that I haven't shown before for in a very long time and they'll need some repairs or cleaning along the way. So that can add to it. Do you uh, watch it before in terms of like flow and what will play for an audience and whatnot? Or? Purely by title and memory. By and however it goes, it goes. Really? Yeah. Oh wow, because the flow works so well I thought. You think so? I thought, I thought. That was something you were intentional. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was, it usually works out that way. Yeah, okay. But I think cartoons just have a habit of doing that. They yeah. kind of bounce off each other. But other than that, it's there's no beyond the theme and what I remember about them. There's no master plan. And sometimes I'll space them out based on. You know, I don't want to have three from one studio so close together or that kind of thing. Yeah. I'll move them around. What's, is there one studio you played more than any other? Or? You know, I don't think so. Um, I play a lot of the... Just because of the period of stuff I have, I play a lot of New York produced things, so a lot of uh, Van Buren from the 30s and late 20s. Uh, a lot of Paul Terry cartoons, so... Mm -hmm. Things like Aesop's Fables and Farmer Alfalfa, uh, Felix the Cat, yeah. Lucky yeah, Jeff, things like that. But occasionally I'll throw in some of the bigger you know, Warner Brothers favorites. Yeah. Uh, like tonight we have a little Bosco cartoon. Oh, cool. Early Warner Brothers. Oh, cool. I was like, oh, you should come to the Cartoon Carnival. And she was like, <laughs> and she was like, oh, hey, what's up? And she was like, she was like this. She was like, oh my God, he's so cute. And I was like, yeah, he collects cartoons from the 1900s to the 1940s. And she was like, oh my God. And I was like, you need to meet him. And she was like, yeah, she was like, yeah, she was all over it. Wow. Yeah. You like, want to see a picture of her? Sure. She might like Dan too. You never know. No, uh, probably not. Dan's a, <laughs> Dan's a, Dan's a big old. Well, this cinephile. is kind of like a weird picture, but I took this picture. Where'd you get this projector from? This I got actually from uh, somebody on Craigslist. I think it was an NYU student who bought it somewhere else. Oh, really? For one filmmaking class, and then they didn't need it anymore. So <laughs> I got it back. How many shows have you done with this projector? This machine, probably about 50, maybe more. It got me more into like Fleischer, like I was always kind of into them, but like after seeing the early stuff, I kind of became more fascinated with them. Yeah. And also like he does, his specialty is like the cartoons in between Windsor McKay and like Felix the Cat, so like that period that people in animation, like professors in animation classes usually skip over. It's like that period that he usually focuses on. summer or consistently but not as many in the fall or winter oh yeah at least once a month i try and do them oh so uh usually every month if i can okay sometimes i have to skip for whatever reason but like we do try and do a halloween oh. christmas and valentine's yeah but even between all that we can come up with these funky Themes like once we did food themed cartoons, yeah, and anything about children, like humanized children, yeah, that was pretty bizarre. So earlier this year, we had a long string of animal themes, so we did like cats, dogs, birds, yeah, 
And then next month we're doing monkeys and gorillas and apes. So <laughs> try and do everything we can. Yeah. But I'm sure there are a lot of themes I still haven't delved into yet. Like, it's just so great to see all these red mushrooms in good shape and not yeah. just seeing them on, like, little, like, pixelated things on YouTube. Because, I mean, you, I mean, pretty, I guess that most of these cartoons are on YouTube, but it's horrible. I'm just wrangled. Like, oh, it was so beautiful before the accident. I don't think anyone really likes Molly Moo Cow. No, Tommy. Is it just you? I love Molly. Big I'm Molly Moo Cow fan? Give them all to me. <laughs> <laughs> This series, we've shown a lot of characters and, and uh, you know, studio output that were once very big names and once very popular. And a lot of us film geeks and historians know these characters and know these series, but a lot of the people coming to these shows have no idea what a lot of it is, and they're just fascinated to see this, you know, potpourri of once famous characters. And I'm not sure if they're that memorable that in a specific sense of people becoming fans of one thing or another because of the show. I think they're just taking it all in as one experience. I mean, I really like the Disney Oswalds, um, but I mean, Farmer Alfalfa is great, Bobby Bumps is great, a lot of the Bray ones, mm -hmm. a lot of the, the early Walter Lance ones, like Dinky Doodle and Pete the Pup. Paul Terry, Farmer Alfalfa, Silent ones are just crazy, and I love them too. I love Tom, the old Tom and Jerry's, the Mutt and Jeffs. I've only seen a few of those, but I love them too. So yeah, I love the silent cartoons. They're great. He showed me, introduced me uh, to Coco the Clown, and uh, Coco the Clown has actually turned out to be one of my favorite cartoons throughout this, the, the whole screening process. Uh, but I've also really uh, gotten to appreciate a lot of the, the Popeyes that he's got in his collection, which are great. What do you like about Molly? I think it's so ridiculous that this is chosen as like a big cartoon character star. But even so, there's something kind of lovable about Molly. I don't know what it is. Nobody agrees with me. So I'm alone in my <laughs> fandom. <laughs> So why don't you like Molly? It's a very annoying cartoon character, one of the worst characters in the history of animation. You should hold a bonfire rally and destroy all Molly Moo Cow cartoon negatives. Do you think next show you'll have more Molly Moo Cow or? I think I will have no Molly Moo Cow. No in Molly Moo? Next show. The problem is with uh, that series is that very few were made in the first place. Yeah. I don't have good copies of all of them. Oh. And to have shown two in one night means that I've kind, kind of gone overboard for yeah. a while. So, uh, Molly Moo Cow tends to be very unpopular, so I think I might spare people for a couple months at least. <laughs> <laughs> In general, I just I'm always shocked to see how how much they got away with, how much the animators got away with, in like in a very subtle sense of how a character you know was portrayed or 
you know, what type of dialogue they use or, you know, the type of action sequence they go through. There are occasions where people will not clap for a film if it ends on a politically incorrect note. And that, that tends to be true even though uh, with these films a lot of what we show tends to have problematic gags like them throughout the content, but when they end on a note like that, that usually leaves the crowd kind of cold. And so we had one of those tonight, and I'll, I'll probably remember that for a while. Various people had gone away for the summer, so I think the travel experiences were fresh in their minds, and hopefully they, you know, some things in the cartoons resonated with them. But the one thing, the one difficult thing that I have in most shows is that, uh, from my vantage point with the projector running next to me, it's hard for me to hear and gauge the reactions of the audience members. So. Sometimes I have to rely on eyewitness accounts for that, but I think it went well. Alright, so that was Movie Stuff. I was Jim Gisrael. You can find me on YouTube, Twitter, and Tumblr, but mainly if you like these videos, check out my stuff on YouTube. I just type in my name, Jim Gisrael, and you will find me. You can Google it as well and find all my stuff there. I make regular and more recent movie reviews also, so whatever big movie came out this week, I'm sure I will have a review of that later tonight. So thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this show. I will be back in two weeks, uh, in which case I will have another episode of Movie Stuff. I'm very happy to be on TV and I really thank Brooklyn Free Speech for having me as always. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed hearing about classic animation and seeing kind of different things. No movie reviews this episode, but trust me, there will be a lot more in the coming episodes. So I hope you guys all have a great weekend and thank you very much for watching.